I built a sawmill. When I started this project, I had very little understanding of how a sawmill works, but now I'm in the future and I can tell you this thing freaking works. This is a series where I go over every step I took to build this so that by the end of it, you'll know everything I know. Today's video is about the gantry and the crank lifting mechanism. Hey, welcome back to the mill project and the last video in this build series. I decided to smash these last two videos in the build series together because quite honestly, the last couple of days that I had in the shop were some of the most intense ones I've ever had. And I think telling the story of the last four days together is gonna make a lot more sense in terms of what actually went down. Basically what happened is I had a total of three weeks to get this mill project completed. I had one full week of vacation that I could work on the mill and then I had to go back to work for another week and then I had one more week off after that. So that's three weeks total where one of them I had to work about 50 hours at work. So what I ended up doing was about seven 12 to 14 hour days in a row in the shop for that first week and then the second week I spent an hour or two after work every single day working in the shop as well. And then in this third week I was trying to do the same thing but then everything just started going wrong. What you just saw me build were the tracks for the gantry. The way I wanted to design these was so that you can place a 2x4 inside the track and that's what everything is going to run on. And then I needed to build some wheels that fit around that track and so all of this can be made out of simple 2x material. For the inside of the wheel I wanted to cut some circles in some 2x4 material and then for the outside of the runner to make sure everything stays on track I could use this 2x6 material and I just cut all of those into the same size circles. Now that I'm done building this, I kind of wish I had just used some plywood for these uh, outside circles because I think that would make a lot more sense. They really don't need to be this wide and then be made out of solid material. They're, they're more prone to cracking than something like plywood would be. But at this point, I was really running low on my plywood selection. So this part might be kind of fun and controversial. I uh, cut some of this piping down to hold the wheels together. And then I cut down some threaded rod just a little bit longer than that and then using that hole that I drilled earlier to make the circles in the first place, I could drill a hole a little bit wider to recess that pipe. This pipe is really helpful for making sure that your wheel is perfectly aligned. There are absolutely easier ways of doing this wheel and track system, but one of the reasons that I wanted to go through all this extra effort to make these wheels in this way was because I wanted to be able to build my tracks in a way that all I had to do was add more 2x4s to the track and then I can get any length of track I want. Because in the future, I may be extending the tracks and I don't really want to have to do anything complicated to build them. So doing all this extra work with the wheels now just simplifies any work I have to do in the future. When all of this is done, I can make the tracks as long as I want, and all it's going to take is a trip to the store to get a few 2x4s. Now because I'm working with the same thickness of material for all of my sections, the fit is going to be too tight for the wheels if I'm not careful. I also needed to cut a relief for a washer on the inside of this wheel housing. This wouldn't fit on top of my table saw or honestly on any of my other tools and so what I decided to do was to bring it over to my jointer and just make a little bit of a relief cut. And this actually ended up working very well but it's not recommended. Do you remember that emergency switch I built a few weeks ago? I ended up attaching it to my jointer and it works really well as an emergency shut off. I can hit it with my knee even if I'm holding the piece with my hands. Now the way a normal person would do this is they'd bring it over to a table saw and make some sort of a relief cut on there, but my table saw doesn't have that much of a depth so I would have to do multiple passes with something like a sled to make that work. And that would work, but I had a lot more overhang than I had reference surface. So what a lot of other people would do is they would bring it over to something like a bandsaw. But if you look really closely in these shots, you'll notice my bandsaw isn't in my shop anymore. I really wasn't a big fan of the way that thing functioned. I could never get it to run true, I could never get it to function right, which I, for the longest time, I thought maybe I just didn't know how to operate a bandsaw, but I have gone through hours and hours of footage of other people showing how to align a bandsaw, and I just could not get that thing to run nice, so I sold it. Honestly, I am really sad to see that thing go, but I just hadn't used it in over a year, and it was just time for it to go. Also, it gave me enough money so I can do this project. I actually sold that bandsaw for more than the cost of this bandsaw mill. And now that I actually have built this thing up and I've actually run it a few times now, it works better than that old bandsaw did. I can actually get it to run properly, which I was never able to do with that old Grizzly. So I think it was a good exchange. 
These wheels were just a bit too tight on the 2x4 track, and so I cut them down on the table saw, and these worked really well once they were done. <sighs> okay, so, <coughs> apparently I screwed up. The, all these threaded rods that I cut are about a half inch shorter than they need to be. And I had these nylon lock nuts that were supposed to fit onto here. So I have a couple of options. I can either countersink into my frame here, which is fine, but I don't really want to reduce the structural integrity because I'm only working with 2x4 material. That's why everything is overbuilt. The other option is to make my own lock nuts, which I've shown how to do on this channel before. Uh, I'll show you again. Before we get to the lock nuts, uh, this is the controversial part. Just before I put these threaded rods through the pipe that's in the center of these wheels, I just completely saturated the whole thing with some bearing grease. Right here you can see how I'm making the lock nut by putting hot glue on the threads before I put the nut on. Obviously you wouldn't normally want to build a bearing this way, but because it's not going to be moving more than a few feet at a time, I'm really not worried about this. It should work fine. The biggest consideration is the fact that it's not going to last forever in this configuration, but to tell you the truth, I'm not 100% sure I'm going to leave this in this configuration. I'm going to have to use this for a couple of months before I really determine what I want it to be, and I can always upgrade this in the future. Everything is just screwed together, so I can always take this apart and add stuff later. The next part of this that I needed to tackle was the lifting mechanism for the gantry, and what this really is is a system of tracks on the front of the gantry that allow a bolt to slip through and that's what's going to keep the head in place. And it's also going to allow a little bit of rigidity in the piece once it's actually milling. The trick here was to get it to not only slide inside the track, but also to allow a bolt to slip through as well. And that's what's going to attach the head to the gantry. At this point during the build, my voice was almost completely back. You could hear it was still a little bit rough at that point. I'm actually feeling a lot better, so those of you who are asking me in the comments, thank you. My voice almost completely went away, and at one point I actually did have to stop doing voiceover work because of how bad it got. But it wasn't until that third week that I actually really started feeling terrible. And that's what you're watching on screen right now. At this point, I hadn't taken any days off in well over three weeks. In a few of these shots, you can see exactly how terrible I'm feeling, but I'm really trying not to let it on because I wasn't realizing that I was actually going to be showing this on the video. I was trying to hide it and really just focus on the build. At this point, I was realizing that I really didn't have enough time to finish all of these projects properly, so I was trying to rush through it and take every minute possible to get this project done by the end of my vacation. And that meant just working through whatever I was feeling. I was just going to keep pushing until I got the project done, because it needed to be done by the end of the vacation, otherwise I was worried it was going to have to sit for a few weeks while I went back to work. It got to the point where every time I picked up one of the larger bolts or the threaded rod or even just a 2x4 that everything started feeling like it was just weighing two or three times as much as it otherwise would. Just moving around a 2x4, just it felt like I was so weak. I don't remember the last time I struggled to pick up more than one 2x4 at a time. And at this point, even though my voice was so much better than it was before, oh my gosh, everything else just got so much worse. During the filming of these last two parts here, I was throwing up every half hour or so at least. At this point, I could see the finish line and I was just not going to let myself give up. I really just needed this to be done because at this point, I still didn't even know if the mill was going to be functional. As far as I knew, as soon as I turned it on and tried to mill something, it was just going to implode on itself, and I, I needed to know whether or not it was going to work. I couldn't just let it sit there for the next week or two, wondering whether or not any of this was going to work. So I just wasn't willing to stop. And that's when I absolutely hit a wall. About three days before the end of my vacation, I got so sick I couldn't even get myself off the couch. I was throwing up constantly, and I ended up sleeping for like 16 hours that day. My thought was is that if I'm going to rest and try to finish this in two days rather than three, that what I really need to do was to get better as fast as I can, so I sorta rested to the extreme. <laughs> at least that was my thinking at the time. At this point, I was about 19 days into the project, and this is the first time I had taken a break, much less worked less than 12 hours in a day. That last day that I took off was a Friday, and on Saturday I needed to host a birthday party for my youngest daughter. She's four now, by the way. And so what that meant is I only had Sunday before I had to go back to work to finish this project, so I really just had to blast through this to get this done. I was considering the gantry done at this point, but I still had to build the lifting mechanism, and this was the last day I could possibly get this done, so I had to keep moving. 
This block that I'm milling down right now came off of my old tail vise. This is one of the earliest projects I ever did. The wood from this actually is one of the things that my grandpa gave me when I was putting my shop together. He gave me a bunch of tools as well as a bunch of pieces of wood. And this wood actually came from a very large oak beam. And so this wood is actually older than both my daughters. After I took this block of wood off of my workbench, I had just been leaving it sitting around for a very special project. So being able to use some of the wood that my grandpa gave me all those years ago in this project means a lot to me. These blocks need to be incredibly robust, which is why I'm building them out of this thick oak. And what they're going to be doing is holding the dowel above the head of the mill, and it's actually going to be acting as the lift mechanism. So all 250 pounds are going to be hanging off these screws that I'm throwing in the back. I decided that this last bracket really needed to be right where the support beam is, which means I needed to screw in from the back end, but of course I can't reach that with the beam in the way, so I had to pull the whole thing down, put screws in through the back, and then I could throw it back up. It wasn't that big of a deal, but I kind of wish I had thought of this ahead of time. I needed to find a way to make sure that the crank was never going to slip on the dowel, and so what I came up with was to make this really wide key. I just cut a big rectangle out of the end of a piece of scrap metal, and then that could be cleaned up on the grinder. And then I needed to start making the ratchet. Now this piece, you can see it's uh, two pieces of three quarter inch plywood glued together. This was another one of those last resort pieces out of my junk pile. Here you go. Whoa, pizza! Pizza! A pizza! It's not a pizza! <laughs> I've never made a ratcheting mechanism before, but I've always thought it was really interesting. The basic concept is you just want to cut even triangles into a circle like this, and then you can use something like a straight edge uh, 90 degrees off of that first line, and that gives you a spot for a board or whatever to latch onto the circle. I'm sure there's all kinds of jigs and things you can make for something like this, but I just did everything by eye and then cut it out on the scroll saw. At this point, I wasn't really sure how much the head was going to lift with one full crank, and so I didn't really do any math to make sure that this was going to cut in any kind of specific measurement. When you're working with a sawmill, it's a good idea to know exactly how high you've lifted every single time, and so people will have all kinds of things from DROs to uh, computer lift mechanisms. I have since found out that one full crank is equal to about five and a quarter inches of travel for the head of the mill. So if I crank this around one full time, I'm going to get a piece that is five and a quarter inches thick. What I really need to do is to figure out how many teeth need to be on one of these so I can evenly space the teeth and so that every tooth is a quarter inch of travel. So if anyone can figure out how many teeth I would need to get a quarter inch of travel per tooth, let me know. I decided for the Paul what I needed to make was something with a long handle on it. And I needed a space for my fingers because I'm going to be mounting this directly to the side of the mill. And this was easy enough to do on a scroll saw, so I just eyeballed it. And they also needed something to act as the handle, so I just drilled a simple hole in the end of the dowel. I ended up drilling this really off-center, but it really doesn't matter. There's no reason that it has to be concentric, so I just went with it. My first attempt of trying to attach this was just a hole straight through the ratchet itself. And I'm pretty sure this would have worked if the head of the mill wasn't so freaking heavy. <laughs> At this point, I was so close to being done. All I had to do was build the lift mechanism and attach it to the gantry, and then I could move the head of the mill over to the gantry and get everything connected together for the first time. Since filming this, I have measured the weight of the gantry head, and it turns out it's just over 250 pounds, but I didn't know that at the time. And then after I got everything connected, I actually had to make a few more adjustments because the weight of this head almost broke the gantry. But once I got all that sorted, I can finally make that first test cut. Keep in mind, at this point in the build, I have absolutely no business being out in the shop, and I'm completely lightheaded, I keep throwing up, and since I have to go back to work the next day, I really should be resting, but I didn't do any of that. At this point, I was just pushing myself forward on pure drive. Otherwise, I had almost nothing left, so I'm gonna let this last part play, and uh, you can see what happened at the end. last piece that gets installed.
on it. It's on the gantry. I need more leverage. Mm. Thank you all for hanging out. So that last cut that I just made was right around 12 inches and you can see that it bogged down quite a bit. So that means I do need to upgrade the engine. Three horsepower is enough to do about a 12 inch cut and depending on how slow you want to go, that actually would be sufficient for a small mill. I'm trying to build a bigger mill so I want to go and uh, I'm going to get the six and a half horsepower that Harbor Freight sells and I'm going to be installing that. I'm going to be doing that off camera. There's also a couple of other little changes that I'm going to make, not really worth discussing, just little things that I got to fix here and there, things that aren't quite aligned properly, but I'm going to do all that off camera. So the next video that you guys are probably going to see from me is going to be a milling video. I have a couple of uh, different logs that I have scoped out in different locations that have already come down. I'm not going to be chopping anything green down, at least not yet. I'll get to that eventually, but um, I want to do that. Also, I need to figure out a better way of doing my log holding. My log holding. So if anybody knows how to do that, um, just with like you know two by four construction lumber, something like that, I would love any uh, suggestions you guys might have. So. Uh, Anyway, thank you all for watching. Um, if you want to see all the videos in, the, in this build series, go ahead and click the playlist at the end of this video. It's also going to be in the description. So thank you all for watching. Catch you all next time. Oh, my gosh.